Welcome. Welcome to all of you to this uh, second webinar of the ADIA uh, MSME Talks. Thank you so much for being with us today and uh, thank you so much to all speakers for uh, participating in this conversation. Uh, while I'm speaking, I see that people are still connecting, uh, but anyway, it's uh, time to start. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, all of you, uh, all participants, for the feedback that we got uh, after the first webinar. Uh, that was very important for us, and this is why we adapted a little bit uh, the format. And this is why I'm here to remind you once again uh, to please uh, keep your microphone muted during this conversation to avoid uh, any kind of background noises. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to interact with you. Uh, rather, we want this conversation to be very interactive. So please uh, don't hesitate uh, to use the chat box to ask questions, to uh, give us ideas. We will get back uh, to the questions uh, uh, that you left in the chat box towards the end of the webinar for our Q&A that uh, TJ Oi from Corrected Connectors with whom we are organizing this series, uh, um, will uh, animate uh, and moderate. So please uh, uh, remember to use the chat box. Because uh, um, some of you the other time also asked us to give uh, some background analytical documents, at some point my colleague Lina through the chat will share some links uh, to area publications uh, that uh, are connected to the conversation we had the other time and we are having today. So if you're interested, feel free to open the links, uh, download uh, the papers uh, and uh, have a look. Anyway, anything we are sharing uh, uh, with you today is also available on our website. But uh, to come to the topic of discussion today, that is e-commerce, I just wanted to share briefly uh, a few facts and figures with you. So as you know, uh, Southeast Asia is one of the fastest growing digital economies in the world, uh, a very dynamic region. Um, that doesn't mean that the region is not being hit uh, by the economic crisis uh, following uh, the pandemic. The latest IMF projections, they forecast uh, minus 2% growth in ASEAN 5 in 2020. But certainly, like in other regions in the world, uh, the pandemic is accelerating the transition to digital. The number of digital consumers has nearly tripled between 2015 and 2018 uh, in the region. Uh, this is data coming from a report from uh, Facebook and Bain Company. So digital consumers were 90 million in 2015 and uh, they were up to 250 million in 2018. So a spectacular growth. And if we look at the e-commerce market, in Indonesia, it is booming at a rate of over 30% per year. And in countries like Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, they're also projected to experience a double-digit growth, as uh, you may find in an area paper from our colleague Lurong Chen that will be shared through the chat box. And something else that I think is also very interesting is that this region is, uh, for some uh, characteristics, uh, well ahead of uh, advanced uh, countries, advanced economies around the world. For instance, if we take uh, the use of e-wallets, in countries like Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, or Singapore, at least 10% of the adult population is using e-wallets. And this penetration rate is uh, well ahead of those in advanced economies. This is why I think the conversation today will be very, very interesting. And we have the privilege to have with us three entrepreneurs and one of our experts from area. We have uh, uh, with us Miss Mel Nava, the founder of One Export. Uh, she created One Export in 2016. One Export is an online platform allowing SMEs to become compliant with international requirements uh, and also find buyers to sell successfully to international markets. One Export's currently serves more than 3,500 MSMEs and 10 farming communities, exporting their products to over 200 uh, stores uh, in different countries worldwide. Uh, we have also the honor to have with us uh, Mr. John Amostan from Singapore. Uh, 
who is active in the field of uh, skill development and training. And over the last uh, six years, he has personally trained numerous executives and staff from uh, different industries and different levels. We have the privilege to have with us Mr. Taung Sunain from Myanmar, who is a leading entrepreneur in the ICT and digital media field in the country. He leads over 200 employees across several businesses, and he has been a pioneer in this sector in Myanmar, also knowing very well the digital ecosystem in the country. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Rasha Shrestha from AIA, uh, an economist with a lot of experience in many different areas, from human capital development, education, global value chains, uh, trade facilitation, and much more. And uh, thank you, Rashosh, for being with us. Uh, uh, he will also share with us uh, uh, remarks uh, throughout the webinar. But let's now start uh, our conversation. And let's start with uh, uh, the big picture. So I would, uh, would like to start uh, to ask uh, to Mel and John, uh, what has been the impact uh, over the last four months uh, uh, for your business. Was e-commerce uh, a game changer for you or not necessarily? So let's start with uh, Mel in the Philippines. Mel, please, the floor is yours. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, hello to well, everyone here um, and magandang uh, hapon to everyone who have joined us from the Philippines. Um, so again, um, as mentioned, uh, my startup is called One Export, and we are helping um, small businesses export. Um, uh, so basically, we sell them to several different markets, such as Australia, US, uh, Singapore, um, Middle East, and um, um, some parts in Asia, like Taiwan and Hong Kong. So um, uh, the past four months, uh, because we are online, um, we actually have grown our sales by four times. Um, and the reason why uh, we have grown our sales was because we service um, and export food products from um, all over the Philippines and we export them to different parts of the, uh, different parts of the world, right? So um, when um, COVID-19 hit um, and um, all of the economies and all of the countries decided to close down and become more cautious, um, trade was a very, very essential part um, because we were selling food, uh, which is an essential product. Um, what happened over time was um, uh, people were prioritizing food um, and, and buying them in um, big bulk, right? So they were prioritizing food and health products and uh, medical um, equipment, which have allowed us to double our sales or repeat our um, repeat our uh, uh, sales over time. So we've had a faster turnover of goods. Um, so um, uh, e-commerce e has been a game changer for, uh, for us because um, we are uh, specifically, uh, you know, um, because we are online, um, you know, when people look for, uh, you know, products from the Philippines or exporting from the Philippines, um, and because we, uh, you know, have invested in um, search engine um, words, you know, uh, people uh, reach out to us from different countries saying, "Can we bring your products? Um, you know, can we bring can we bring Philippine products to this to to a particular country?" And we're able to service them um, uh, more so. Um, even with the lockdowns that have happened in the Philippines. Um, because uh, exporting was considered an essential industry here, uh, we have been continuing to export. So our operations have not been disrupted, uh, and so our even our sales have not yet uh, have not uh, have not uh, dipped at all because because exporting is an essential industry. So um, you know, for all of the business owners here, I would of course. Um, be very uh, encouraging, you know, encourage everybody here to export because, you know, even in a crisis, even in a recession, um, governments will uh, be very, very, um, governments will be very, very uh, supportive about exporting. And so um, that, that is one of the things that, that is one of the reasons why we've grown. But also um, during COVID-19, um, the company has been very intentional, you know, about how we want to run the business. 
And um, during COVID-19, we specifically thought about um, who we want to serve, why we want to serve, and um, you know, what company do we want to be after that. And so after, um, after much deliberation and thought, um, one export has uh, taken an export empower and employment strategy, um, which we are uh, uh, very much living up to this day. So, um, for example, uh, we, of course, um, our main major business is to be able to export goods and to be able to export them as fast as possible. So by making sure that the turnover of goods are, are fast enough so that we uh, are able to export more. Um, but also uh, the, the other strategies were how do we empower micro, small, and medium enterprises, right? And so what we have done over the past few months is to, you know, create crowdfunding campaigns so that we can finance orders of MSMEs so that they can export, but also like find um, reseller and distribution channels in the United States. So um, that's where we go to the empower strategy where for the um, overseas Filipino um, overseas Filipino um, immigrants based in the United States, we give them um, an, uh, we give them a way where they're able to import products from the Philippines and support uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, fascinating uh, experiences. Please, John, uh, uh, what would you like to tell us? Uh, hi, everyone. It's good to be here with all of you. And um, I think most of us have faced the most, I would say, traumatic four months of our lives uh, than ever before. And I think as a traditional uh, business owner myself, um, it's pretty hard because we are so used to the traditional ways of uh, uh, doing business and especially in the training and development, we usually go face to face with the clients and you can actually show them your enthusiastic uh, enthusiasm and then you can show them what you can do through different exercises or that. But suddenly all this will, will stop. And so we were, we were, to be honest, we were at a loss uh, right, right at the front. So um, I guess there's only one way to go. <laughs> so that's really go online and go through e-commerce. Uh, it, it was a hard learning curve for us because um, we were not ready then. We were not ready then. So there are many things that we actually um, uh, went through that, that I felt that it was uh, un very unprepared. And, and it actually gives us a, 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 a many um, insights to what is happening in the, in the, in the online business world. So uh, I want to encourage all of us, if, if there's a time to go e-commerce, this is the time. <laughs> this is the time. It's not just for the pandemic, but in the future, this will be the way that people will, will facilitate and people will function. And uh, just maybe want to share with all of us that um, the one thing that we realized uh, uh, after going e-commerce is that the user experience is very important the user experience, what we used to be able to um, deliver face-to-face, -face, now we have to convert it to online. How are you going to bring that customer's experience to your client in that short period of time, in that few clicks, and you have to make sure that they are satisfied? Yeah, the user experience equal to customer satisfaction. And, and that actually turns out to be, uh, you know, online, you, you, you're not just a word of mouth, but you have real rating. People will know what you actually did and how well you do. Yeah. So that will actually also bring about another positive point. If your service, if you are able to convert your services and your products uh, in a short span of time to, to, to bring that satisfaction up, there is also a free marketing uh, 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 avenue for you because people will start telling people, and, then we, and, and, and online is so easy, social media, they just share your post and they will tell about your services and, uh, um, and what you can do for, for them. Yeah, so, um, but at the same time, um, I think one thing that I've also learned through, through these four months of pandemic is that do not do everything yourself because you have to ask for help. For, for example, one very clear cut way is uh, digital marketing. Digital marketing, is a forest, it's, it's a jungle. <laughs> there are so many ways of doing digital marketing and how to build a sales funnel, how to 
how to create that that options to build uh to buy in all that i think uh, it's it's time if you haven't embarked on e-commerce i will really encourage you to start talking to start talking to, to to people about how do we go go there because that will really help you as a business owner uh, for now for uh, during the pandemic and in future post the pandemic it will be this way uh that's 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 my sentiment for this uh where we where we are and where we will be yeah so thank you thank you very much john uh, so now let's go to myanmar uh, with someone that has a great experience in the digital sector uh, what trends have you been observing in the last few months uh, Taun? um Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for inviting me and Ming Lava to my fellow countrymen from Myanmar. Um, so over here, we had the first COVID case uh, back in March. And then since then, the country has gone into lockdown mode. Um, now we're slowly reopening. Uh, we have around 300 cases of um, reported uh, positive COVID-19 cases. Um, and of course, during the lockdown, uh, restaurants, hotels, um, tea shops, many such businesses were uh, hit especially hard. Um, some reporting basically 0% uh, uh, revenue. And then also um, to make the impact harder, we had a 10 day um, New Year holiday period in, in the month of April, uh, which is our uh, water festival. So um, uh, workers and you know people usually return to their hometown. So this is normally already the the time of the year where businesses are expecting to you know slow down quite a bit so you know we had a double whammy uh effect uh during the month um some hotel owners that i know uh, have talked about you know having zero revenue uh some of them are likely to shut down um when when the reopening resumes in the, over the next uh couple of months uh some restaurant owners um uh, have reopened, but uh, report only 50% um, of the revenue that they had uh, before the COVID. Um, and the impact of digital uh, transformation due to COVID-19 uh, has largely been, you know, of course, positive, uh, looking at it from the digital perspective. Uh, but in a country like Myanmar, where it's really difficult to get um, accurate data, so um, I can only give you estimate um, uh, the the volume of e-commerce transactions uh, estimates have you know ranged very you know widely from uh, just double digit uh, in, in U.S. millions to a couple hundred millions um, you know uh, in 2019. Uh, but the only thing certain is that Myanmar's e-commerce sector, compared to other ASEAN nations, is still in its uh, nascent stage. It's still very much uh, in the early stage. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, infrastructure weaknesses, a lot of development still to be had. Um, latest surveys uh, suggest that there could be um, 10,000 jobs in the digital economy sector, which is, of course, expected to grow a lot more over the next um, few months and next couple of years. Um, and many of the affected businesses um, had you know, successful pivots to uh, online retailing, uh, curbside pickups, um, home deliveries, um, you know, not only uh, you know, retailers, restaurants, but also uh, consumer electronics stores and so on. They all uh, pivoted to online retailing um, you know, when they had never done so before. Um, and uh, you know, not only uh, initially it was just the essential items that were in high demand um, on online ordering, but um, you know, consumer electronics has been a bright spot in the in the sector. Um, apparently, you know, people want to spend more time on entertainment. Uh, they want to um, you know furnish their homes, so their furnitures and you know home improvement stuff have been uh, selling uh, a bit higher than you know the the period compared to last year the surprising factor has been the influx of entertainers and other celebrities um you know who just up and started you know delivery services and using their star power using their celebrity power to you know uh to offer home cooked meals and for nostalgia you know about uh, food and specialties from uh, their hometowns for example 
and people have kind of like just you know uh, taken it up. Online learning courses have have also sprung up as um, in the months of March, April, May. Um, as you know, entrepreneurs uh, like myself, uh, you know, have some time. You know, we we offer some online learning courses, sharing our ex experiences. Uh, currently in Myanmar, cash on delivery accounts for 85% of e-commerce transactions. Uh, so that's, you know, there's a lot of space for uh, financial technology and credit cards and other payment systems. Um, you know, food has, uh, you know, double in, in their sales volume. Uh, Facebook is the overwhelming method of accessing information and online services, not just for news, entertainment, videos, and online shopping, but also even, you know, searching for things works better on Facebook than in Google. Um, and a lot of this uh, online retail boom has, of course, happened on Facebook live video streams uh, with, you know, some local marketplaces and shopping platforms taking place. So I'm hopeful that many of these newly uh, digitized businesses will remain digital and uh, they will remain online and pave the way for more innovations in the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this usage of Facebook as an alternative channel for e-commerce is uh, really amazing. And this is why they are launching Facebook Shop, at least at the beginning in the US. We'll see when it will come to Asia. But now let's move to uh, Rashesh. Um, please feel free to share uh, some your remarks with us, uh, especially, you know, in terms of uh, skills and the types of skills development MSMEs may need to uh, upgrade uh, when talking about uh, e-commerce. Okay, uh, thank you, Julia. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, so I'm not a business owner, so I don't have the experience of uh, our other panelists. So I'll be talking from economics, uh, economist's perspective. So when it comes to the e-commerce, as Julia mentioned, the pandemic uh, had, even before the pandemic, the, the growth was quite remarkable uh, in the region. but uh, the pandemic has now made it almost indispensable to, to, um, for, for MSMEs. But uh, even when it is indispensable, that doesn't mean that the e-commerce is the right choice for everyone, right? The key question here is that of profitability. I mean, e-commerce can be a double-edged sword. Um, SMEs have access to new consumers, uh, but there's also, they face increased competition from other businesses. Uh, so in a traditional model, SMEs used to make uh, uh, use of the locational advantages and personal connections to operate the business. Uh, this is less relevant for e-commerce, which is a world of algorithms and optimization, which is completely new uh, for many SMEs. The, the consequence of uh, competition is that the pricing decision is now out of the hands of SMEs. So in the online marketplace, SMEs are what we economists call price takers. So they are not free to charge any price that is necessary to cover their costs, uh, since there will be thousands of other businesses also offering the same product at probably a cheaper price. Rather, they'll have to stand out in some other way. Uh, but ultimately, in terms of pricing, they'll have to accept what is called the prevailing um, equilibrium market price uh, if they want to capture any market share or a significant market share in the e-commerce platform. Um, so, uh, but the market uh, price that is, exists for their particular product may not uh, be able, enough to cover additional costs for all SMEs. Um, as a result, uh, so for, for those SMEs for whom the cost of production is lower than the market price, uh, they can be profitable and survive on the e-commerce platform. But those who do not uh, will have to operate at a loss. So a better option than operating at a loss is actually to avoid the online market price altogether. Anyways, the, 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 the upshot is that the SMEs who want to succeed online will have to find ways to lower the cost of running their businesses, uh, especially in the online platforms. Um, so what are the, some of the new costs that the SMEs face when uh, going online? Um, so there's the regular business costs, but in addition, and like our earlier panelists also mentioned this, uh, so that some new costs that the SMEs have to incur. So we, we, we heard about the, the importance of uh, online advertising and uh, customer acquisition. Uh, so achieving, achieving uh, visibility online is uh, very difficult and SMEs need to know how to make themselves stand out. Uh, maintaining high ratings, so e-commerce is a ratings driven business and rather than uh, forming personal relationships uh, uh, which were more important for the traditional model. So there's a higher volume of trade and inventory to manage which may need specialized software. Um, they need to handle returns and exchanges because that's one of the key services in online uh, businesses. Uh, there's also a need to deal with logistics, uh, which was not uh, initially in the offline mode. So these are some new challenges that SMEs do have to face in the online world. Um, 
And in the short term, uh, one of the key determining factors uh, that would be necessary or that will be important uh, for the success of SMEs is the skills of the entrepreneurs uh, taking the current state of infrastructure as given, which is not going to change very soon. Uh, entrepreneurs who have the right kind of skills to operate in the digital world uh, will face a lower cost of entering into the e-commerce uh, business and then someone who has to learn these skills uh, anew. So what kind of skills are we talking about? Uh, so this is not just a matter of having technical skills, right? So it's also like digital literacy, creating an online store or processing online orders. These are all technical skills that the entrepreneur will need to have or, or get help uh, from other uh, employees like um, John mentioned. Um, they also have to have the necessary interpersonal skills to kind of deal with many customers, um, to handle the special request or to address problems uh, with the orders such as returns or exchanges, right? So these are all additional interpersonal skills that needs to be uh, developed. Um, so some of the costs, uh, new costs that we I mentioned earlier are what are called fixed costs. Uh, so these are uh, costs that have to be incurred even before any sales are being made. And so the scale of operation is going to be very important. So the scale of operation will have to be large enough to actually be able to cover those initial fixed costs of entering the online uh, business. And in that case, um, that places a greater demand because of the, because the scale of operation is going to go, is going to be much uh, larger uh, in order to be profitable. Uh, they'll have greater demands and cognitive skills that is necessary to do business optimization and management at higher volumes. So if we think about what will be, uh, what is the, the trend towards it as, uh, online e-commerce uh, for SMEs, we have to, I guess, understand that it's going to be a very selected group of SMEs that are going to be actually able to succeed in the online platform. And the key question is, how can we help the rest of them um, uh, to actually be able to, uh, co to cover those costs and, and meet the challenges of the, uh, the e-commerce world? Okay, that's, that's, that's my starting remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for these extremely interesting uh, uh, insights, Rashesh. So we can move now to the second round of questions. And uh, uh, we will look at uh, uh, future trends. I mean, this is something that Rashesh has, uh, in a sense, already anticipated. But now, perhaps, let's start this uh, second round with uh, Taung in Myanmar. Uh, how do you see e-commerce influencing business in Myanmar moving forward? And can you share with us any final tip uh, for uh, entrepreneurs? I mean, uh, people that are connecting today, running a business. Um, yes, thank you. So um, I'm sharing this based on, you know, my experience in the Myanmar economy. So uh, it may not be, you know, as, as pioneering as some of you are, you know, facing in your own country. So excuse me if I'm, you know, speaking, uh, you know, a few years behind. Um, but I've observed that, you know, we've shed some of the old unproductive um, habits and behavior. Um, for example, uh, in Myanmar, timekeeping was, a, was an exercise in patience. You know, um, meeting times were, you know, usually late. Um, uh, but, you know, during the COVID pandemic, a lot of time has been spent on Zoom and other virtual video conferencing solutions. Back-to-back -back meetings are the norm. Uh, meetings have become faster, more productive, more, more effective. And, you know, we no longer can say traffic helped me, but, me up. Uh, but uh, although a new excuse has uh, become popular, which is the link didn't work or, you know, my Wi-Fi was bad. Um, so uh, I do see e-commerce having a, a generational impact uh, on Myanmar businesses. And, you know, here, here are the big um, e-commerce trends that, that I'm, you know, watching, uh, not only in Myanmar, but also regionally as well as globally. Um, you know, something that's been um, becoming more and more uh, popular and more having a higher impact uh, over the past couple of years has been uh, influencer marketing. Um, of course, this took off in, in markets like the US and, you know, other markets much earlier than, than in Myanmar. Um, you know, and this is not just hiring influencers, but we should also be looking at uh, our own brands uh, becoming influencers themselves. You know, our businesses becoming brands, our brands are further becoming influencers. Um, so, you know, when we say influencer marketing, don't just think about you know, having to pay the top dollar for, you know, a celebrity in your country. How can you, how can your brand become a celebrity itself? How can you, brand, how can your brand become a thought leader uh, in the space that you are? Um, 
And the other trend that I'm watching is uh, platformization platforms. So uh, take advantage of platforms such as e-commerce platforms like Shopify, um, social network platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, but also beware of the, the whims of you know, algorithmic changes. Um, beware of platforms replacing you, you know, with their homegrown uh, vanilla brands, uh, their homegrown products. So, um, which leads to the next uh, trend that I'm watching, which is um, how can you build a direct community um, you know, for your brands uh, with a direct channel so that you, although you're utilizing the reach and the, um, the extensive network of the platforms, you do have at your leisure and at your luxury uh, an effective algorithm, an effective method to reach your customers without having to, you know, pray that the algorithms are favoring you today or this week. So communities is, is the third one. The fourth one is um, data. Uh, this has been, um, you know, a trend for the past decade. So this is nothing new. Um, but how can, you know, how can small businesses, how can Southeast Asian uh, companies and businesses and SMEs um, create more data. When we talk about data and AI, these are things that we normally associate with, um, you know, the big companies like Google and Facebook and, you know, large multinationals having access to it, knowing how to use it. But how can we SMEs uh, start learning how to create data, how to capture data, how to use them in our daily business operations? Just like uh, simple targeting at uh, in Facebook, it's so easy. You can click, 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 and you know you basically um, can target. So, like a credit score. Um, so, how do we uh, use those data in our day-to-day -day business operations, recruitment, um, you know, distribution, uh, even you know, just social lifestyles like eating out. How do we? How can we have data? How can we use data to help us make these uh, decisions? So the new normal has been a wake up call to many Myanmar businesses. Many business leaders have, um, you know, tr uh, tasted the, uh, the digital life. And my hope is that we don't go back to the old, old normal routines. And if we are able to retain some of the new normal, um, then I'm at least consoled that the sacrifices and the significant losses of life that we've all had to endure um, have not been in vain. And only when we have the bulk of society, SMEs and large businesses and students, parents, government leaders, um, adopt, adapting to the new digital way of life, will we have a truly structural uh, transformation of our economy from an agriculture and resource-based country to a fully developed modern society? Thank you. Thank you very much for these very interesting remarks uh, about what's happening and will happen most likely in Myanmar. Uh, now let's uh, get the point of view of John uh, from Singapore. Again, I mean, uh, what trends are you anticipating and any tips you would like to share? Yeah, um, you know, after we embark on e-commerce, our client base and the bottom line have actually increased and we have reached out to more countries than, than before. and. Uh, one thing that really benefited us was uh, when we set the infrastructure uh, ready, uh, we actually benefit a lot from it because we, we work less from there. Because once it, once the pipeline is is fixed, is it will be easier for the business owner. Um, the trend that personally what we are seeing is that um, customers will be focusing on these few points: what is fast, what is easy, safe, and of quality. Yeah, so it, um, it, it, nowadays customers are very, very demanding. Not that they, they not, not only they want fast, easy, safe, but they also want of a certain quality that they order from online. If not, they will just return you the goods and then they will expect you to, to, uh, to send back. Yeah, um, so the, the you know, reports say that the online growth is uh, unstoppable. Uh, there'll be four by four by five trillion dollars in 2021. So that is really a, 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 a mind-boggling uh, sum that we, we should look at also. Uh, the, the trends that um, uh, what I have been observing is that there are mainly five uh, things that are happening. One, number one is the rise of mobile commerce. 50% uh, of the web traffic actually comes from smartphone and tablets. 
and uh, because it's easy, it's time saving, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and it's uh, comfortable. You can do it wherever, wherever you are in your bedroom, in the toilet. You no, know, you can just purchase anything just with a click. And the second trend that is uh, happening is this thing called omni challenge, uh, omni channel capabilities. That means you can buy online, you can pick up from the store. You don't have to wait for the delivery. You can have, have a choice to pick up from the store. And then you can buy online or return in the store. The, the key is to make easy and if necessary, additional step can be taken at the physical place where they feel more comfortable and secure. Yeah. So online has been evolving, uh, not just happening online, but you actually include physical space into the online services. Uh, third trend that um, I've been looking at also, there's this uh, on-demand society where they, they purchase and deliver in a convenient and timely manner, meaning that you have to follow exactly my timing, no longer the, the merchant's timing. You have to follow me. I want it this time, you have to deliver this time. I want it this way, you have to deliver this way. So that's what we call the on-demand society. Uh, fourth trend that I've been looking at is uh, this thing called um, demand for the niche products. Because, uh, uh, you know, when we, for example, you go for a movie and you look at Star Wars, and then suddenly you are interested to buy a figure at the latest episode. But we, traditionally, we can't buy off the shelf because it's so new. But now it's different. Now you can almost get it immediately after the movie or even before the movie are movie, uh, uh, shown. So you can actually, uh, with, uh, there are websites that specifically sell you the niche products where there is a, there's a uh, report saying that there's an increase in the demand. And the last uh, for me is a uh, comparison shopping. Shoppers can find and compare and compare and compare again. You know, to, just to make sure that they get the best deal. Yeah, especially Singaporeans, you know, uh, you just want to get the best, the, the, the good, the cheap, you know, uh, and fast and everything. Yeah, so, but before I, I, I round up my, my uh, sharing, I think there's one, the, the one thing is very important is the, the front end and back end experience. E-commerce is basically uh, what we see uh, online is actually just the front line. But many of us actually uh, did not pay attention to what actually happening at the back end. Because the back end is very sophisticated. And one, one tips I would uh, really want to recommend to all the entrepreneurs, all the business owners, all, all of you out there is that uh, you have to consider whether are you able to translate or to, 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 um, to make that customer service experience pleasant when you launch your online campaign. Because you can have a wonderful uh, 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 payment uh, system, but you cannot deliver. If you cannot deliver on time, you cannot deliver in quality, you cannot meet the needs and the demand of the customers. That will be a very, very big problem. People don't really care how, how, how good you look online. They want the services, they want the experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Other very interesting trends emerging also from your remarks. Yeah. And now let's move to Mel. Okay, so, um, well, of course, let, let's recognize everything that um, the previous speakers have said, digital marketing and um, becoming present in a lot of the, um, you know, I think distribution and um, uh, presence online and offline are very important. But um, I guess uh, just to add on to uh, what the initial uh, feedback was or what was initially said was um, uh, the trends um, for global trade at least will always depend on how fast the recovery is right so for example if um, uh, in the Philippines where uh, you have a rising number of cases um, the essentials are um, in high demand because uh, it, it you know people are after um, making sure that everybody is safe um, that the basic goods are met so so um or but for example in countries like australia where um you know a lot of there are a lot of recoveries and there are a lot of um uh like trust that you know the people will likely not get the virus in their areas um so, uh, economies are starting to open up and um, um other demands are start like other non-essential demands are starting to pick up so um 
I guess in a global trade perspective, you always have to look at, you know, where are we or what, where do you want to serve? If you want to serve the local market, you have to check how fast the current recovery is. Um, and if you, it's not as fast or, or if you're not yet fully recovered, then you have to sort of pivot to selling essential products or making your products essential. So um, if you're selling food products, how do you make sure that um, it's essential? So you maybe uh, market it in a way that, you know, these are, you know, these are safe or this will allow you to um, uh, make sure that the virus, uh, you know, you don't, you do not get anything from the virus, you know, so uh, it'll, it'll prevent you from getting the virus. So I guess that's the, that's the first. Um, uh, the other interesting point about e-commerce, of course, um, uh, which was not mentioned yet, is um, the shift of um, the supply chain. So supply chain was completely disrupted because um, people's, uh, people were uh, heavily relying on China. So one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, opportunities that we're looking at right now is um, how can we make our uh, goods um, competitive enough so that we can sell to other markets abroad because um, other uh, businesses in the United States and Europe are looking for alternatives that are not China products. So if you're able to create um, you know, a really good manufacturing system or if you're able to create something that will allow, um, will allow for uh, you know, better, and if you're able to export these products to businesses abroad, um, it will be easier in terms of like, uh, you know, disrupting the current supply chain, which is currently um, uh, dominated by China. And I guess the last one is, um, you know, e-commerce uh, is one. So basically going online is one of the things that um, people will look into. But aside from that, uh, people are also looking at social commerce. So it's not just e-commerce. It's not just about being online, but it's also about referrals. It's also about you know um, what you know what what people think are trendy. Uh, so for example, in the Philippines, um, when um, all of the uh, all of the markets closed, all of the malls closed, for example, um, there was an increase in home cooked meals. Um, and, but certain trends on home cooked meals. So for example, um, uh, you know, like a, so so I guess that's the that's the thing. So referral is very important. Network is very important, and if you get uh, if you get recommended or if people talk about you um, through their friends and family, you are likely to increase sales. So um, I guess uh, of course the last part uh, is um, making sure that you are able to serve the local market, local market efficiently, and also be able to um, find opportunities in export during this time. Because of course, as mentioned earlier. Uh, export is deemed as an essential industry, and because of that, um, there are a lot of uh, you know there are a lot of opportunities um, with exporting. So yeah. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, and now let's go to Rashesh. Uh, your remarks uh, at the end of the second round. Yeah. Uh, thanks again, Julia. So uh, I just like to uh, mention a couple of things. Um, so. First, the pandemic has accelerated the trend towards greater digitalization and e-commerce. So consumers are becoming more comfortable uh, ordering goods online, which means that SMEs will have no, will also have more opportunities, um, but they'll also have to adapt quite quickly. Um, the changing uh, consumer preference towards online shopping means that SMEs actually don't have much of a choice in this matter, actually, because they will have to, uh, to, to uh, go there um, eventually. I mean, we hear about in the U.S. Amazon uh, closing down the number of retail stores in the United States because a lot of consumers want to buy everything online. Um, so while that that scale of threat is probably not uh, as severe for Asia because the connectivity is still not that widespread, um, it is very real, and and we have to start adapting uh, to the upcoming trends uh, quite soon. Um, so when discussing the outlook for the medium term, I think we do have to distinguish between retail, retail uh, uh, trade and then services. Um, in retail, switching to online marketplace is not uh, that complicated. It's quite straightforward in some sense. I mean, it's simplifying a bit, but it is just about uh, receiving an online order instead of an in-person order and then shipping the goods uh, to the customers. For services, it is uh, slightly more complicated because even if the service online platforms do uh, uh, bring the consumers, customers, and the service providers online together. The a lot of the services are still personal services, and these are the ones that are offered by many SMEs. 
so before the pandemic uh, the the online uh, the small uh, service providers actually used uh, platforms like gojek um, to to find customers but they still had to provide the services in person so as long as the social distancing rules are still in place uh, because of the pandemic the personal service industry can really rely on e-commerce to pick up the sales uh, until the pandemic is completely over um and in terms of profitability uh, that I mentioned, um, I think larger enterprises are more likely to benefit uh, because they can actually optimize better and lower their cost on the back of the back end uh, business processes, such as inventory management, and therefore turn a profit even if they offer really low prices. Then the question for SMEs is uh, whether they can compete and thrive in the presence of giants like you know Amazon and Alibaba, who not only provide the platforms, uh, like uh, earlier commentator mentioned, but also they compete for the customers by providing their own products. I think the best hope uh, for SMEs is that uh, they want to reduce the cost of operating online as much as possible. Um, and many of these costs actually depend on uh, government services and policies, and not they're outside the, the control of the SMEs themselves. So efficiency of infrastructure will be very important. Right? So I once talked to a guy who was selling um, uh, eye, eye, eyeglass, uh, eye, eye, eyeglass frames uh, online uh, to cut costs. They did not uh, have any inventory, uh, uh, but rather they imported the inventory when the customers placed an order. But he wasn't complaining about the delays in the border. It was hurting his business, right? So, so that's some of this uh, broader infrastructure issues that needs to be uh, solved for for to, to for SMEs to be successful in the online marketplace. In some many cases, direct financial services uh, or direct financial supports may be important um, as well to in order to help transition SMEs to the online platforms. Uh, for ex many existing businesses who want to go digital, I think the government really needs to invest in some sort of digital extension service uh, that will support the SMEs transition to the online marketplace. Uh, so service could be provided privately uh, with government support, or it could entirely be run by government, similar to the agriculture extension programs that government have to help farmers. Um, so in the longer term, I think uh, I talked about skills earlier. So it's very important to uh, create those skill development system that will be, uh, that will ensure that the uh, increased digital digitalization does not actually widen the digital divide. Uh, this means that we have to develop a public education system that will be uh, able to provide the high quality cognitive, social, emotional and technical skills uh, that will be necessary to navigate in the digital marketplace. Um, so with, uh, with all of these uh, policy and infrastructure that are necessary, uh, will be necessary uh, in order for the SMEs to actually thrive in the uh, online marketplace going forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ashash, also for reminding us uh, how important it is to have good competition policy for the digital era. And this is something that is more a tip for policymakers and not only entrepreneurs. But with that, let's move quickly uh, to the Q&A. I, I saw that the chat has been quite active, so I leave now the floor to TJ. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, we have a few questions that have come in. So let me just go straight into the first question that came from Wendy from the Philippines. Um, Wendy was saying that, you know, for in our country, many people have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Um, naturally, they would be engaging on online businesses to sustain their needs. Um, if they are new to e-commerce, to online business, um, would the, perhaps the speakers be able to suggest uh, some effective e-marketing strategies that could be used? Um, let me throw this question to our two entrepreneurs. I shall start with the lady first. So if Mel, if you could share, you know, perhaps just one or two um, tips or strategies that you have used uh, that could be helpful to uh, Wendy. Okay, so hi Wendy. Um, so basically, uh, for of course, uh, there are platforms uh, that are readily available. I would first suggest you try and go to the platforms first that you um, that that you feel are easy for you, right? So you can do a trial and error. Like um, in the Philippines, uh, there are two major marketplaces like Shopee and Lazada. Um, so uh, uh, you know there they have a large number of um, uh, customers, um, but also like uh, some of their uh, onboarding is relatively easy. Now, if you are still having a hard time for that, um, there are uh, many apps. So I will message you privately 
for um, these uh, these uh, uh, these apps. Basically, it's like if you have a Facebook page and you put your products online, um, the mini app is sort of like a chat bot that will answer the questions of um, the, the or answer the inquiries of uh, of these um, these customers, and then eventually, like, so you can close a sale. So, for example, normally the first questions would be. Um, what are your price points? Uh, what are your products? Are you available? Can you ship out? So these um, these these are sort of automated responses already. And then all you have to do is focus on delivering the products. So, but of course, um, considering the Philippines, uh, uh, infrastructure is very important. So depending on where you are, um, you know, you there are different ways to deliver the products. Um, so, of course, if you're based in Metro Manila, you have all of these res resources. But if you are based in the provinces, um, you know, there are um, other logistics careers that you have to really take into consideration. So, um, I guess uh, I can, uh, like, because the question is very general and I think there's a very, very specific, um, uh, I can, uh, specific question to this afterwards. I can maybe chat uh, with you separately. Um, but at least, so uh, you know, like uh, I'll I'll be able to assist you and help you um, in terms of going online. Um, so yes. Okay. Thanks very much, Mel. John, because your business is slightly different, right? Um, in embarking on e-commerce, so what were the type of um, e-marketing strategies that you had to adopt? Um, okay. The 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 internet is like a sea. First of all, I think you have to know what kind of fish you want. Mm -hmm. So um, you, that's why customer analysis is very important. Um, you have to know who you are targeting. And the key is to narrow down your target market as much as possible. Because uh, that will only make your uh, whatever you want to do more efficient. If not, you will be like me right in the beginning. You no, know, I throw out at the sea and then I get octopus, I get shark, I get, but they are not my clients. Yeah, so so customer analysis is the first thing. And then, um, you know, it's always easy to set up an online page. But the, the diffic difficult part is how to get people come to your online page. Mm -hmm. So uh, to simplify it, um, the easiest way that you can do is Facebook advertising. So Facebook advertising will guide you step by step. Like who, who uh, what campaign you're having, what product you're selling, uh, who is your target market, then you can narrow down which country, what age, male or female, is that a profession? Uh, those things, they will guide you step by step. So it's very easy to follow uh, Facebook advertising. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, if your target market is slightly to, uh, is different from the Facebook uh, demographics, which is maybe younger, then you may want to consider Instagram or, 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 or Snapchat. No, uh, so uh, good news is that now Facebook and Instagram actually tied up and, and you can actually advertise on Facebook and your ad will go over to Instagram where they, where they will also see your ad uh, with a different demographics. Yeah, so those are the things that you can consider doing for the beginning. Uh, eventually, when you are more uh, maybe seasoned or more experienced and you want to explore further and if you want to scale up really in your e-commerce, uh, you may want to try a sales funnel. A sales funnel is more complicated. It, it, it got different um, stages where you where you first attract and then you bring them in and you get their data and then subsequently you sell them and then you sell them again and then you upsell them again and then <laughs> at the end <laughs> you still are selling your things. So it is a long process of selling and selling but in a very comfortable way. Yeah. So uh, uh, you, you, you can look out for e-commerce courses. Uh, we'll be conducting some e-commerce courses coming up. So you can feel, feel free to look at uh, our courses also. Sorry, uh, just a free advertising here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, John. So, um, you know, just to ride on as an entrepreneur myself, um, like what Mel and John shared, I think the important thing is to know who your target audience is to know what is the existing trend within your own country. Yeah. What are the platforms that people go to? Because, you know, the platforms that people go to in Singapore may be different from, say, in Indonesia, and therefore, you know, the whole dynamics changes. Now, let me then quickly go on to um, the next question. Um, in terms of the 
infrastructure, you know, the supporting infrastructure to support e-commerce, um, it, it would seem that, you know, there have been challenges, especially perhaps in the developing countries. Um, a question then to, uh, let me throw this to our economists and our researchers and also perhaps to um, Mr. Tuang. Um, what role do you think the private sector can play to promote more infra, uh, investments in this whole ICT infrastructure? Um, maybe if I could get Rashesh to share a little bit, just a quick one. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I think the infrastructure issue is very important. Like I mentioned, connectivity is still a big problem in a lot of our Asian countries. And, uh, and so we need to really have strong infrastructure in place, if, if, especially if you want to lower the cost of the SMEs uh, to that are trying to enter this, the, the market, uh, the, the online marketplace. In terms of the, I, I mean, I think what, what is the best uh, case for this last infrastructure project is the public-private partnerships uh, where we, uh, we, because these are large utility uh, investments, so they need a pretty large sum of investment. So, so I don't think private sector itself uh, can do much uh, by itself, but I think what we need is a, some sort of partnership between the public, uh, the government, and the uh, and the private sector in order to to come up with the necessary funds that is necessary uh, to to make these infrastructures more efficient and and more conducive to uh, digitalization for the region. Thank you. Thank you, Rashesh. Um, Tuang, would you have anything that you want to add? Because um, especially for Myanmar, we are seeing you know there is a development and growth in, in the whole online and ICT. Um, where do you see the private sector being able to play their part in this? Um, I think the private sector, of course, plays a very important role, but I think the government, the public sector has to lead it because in a country like Myanmar, where the economy was centralized for a very long time, there was very little investment in um, you know, innovation and in infrastructure. So the country suffered greatly due to the lack of infrastructure. And this included uh, telecommunications. Um, you know, we had, uh, we were selling, we were buying, we we're paying uh, up to $2,000 for a SIM card. This is without the iPhone, uh, you know, just for a SIM card. Uh, uh, as recently as I think about seven, eight years ago, um, you know, so of course now it's a dollar fifty, so it's become much normalized. But um, you know, the government played a big role in um, arbitrarily keeping the prices very high. And then when they deci decided to liberalize, um, you know, we all benefited greatly around 2013. Um, so uh, you know, the public sector's role is very important. But private sector, when the government does decide to open it up and free it up, the private sector has to be ready to innovate, um, to to invest. So um, the the uh, foreign investors coming in, um, when they look at the um, you know the opportunities, not only do they just look at you know the greenfield opportunities, but they also look for uh, good, reliable partners, partners with good track records, and so on. So uh, I think an economy. Um, in order to receive the right kind of investment also has to have the right kind of uh, local players that have the right kind of capacity and institutional um, you know, uh, infrastructures built in, uh, built up also. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for your questions. I have probably about one, two minutes left. I'm going to lump this question very broadly because there were two, three questions that were asking about taxation as well as then the trade facilitation part. Um, Mel, I'm going to just kind of put you, put you in a limelight here a little bit because a lot of what you do is cross-border, yeah. you know. Um, what, what are your views? Very quick one in terms of, you know, what, what measures do you think are needed to facilitate more cross-border trading as well as um, taxation in general yeah, for online, online transactions? Okay, so for um, for facilitation, for trade facilitation to other countries, I think the very important parts we have to consider is compliances, right? So, um, especially with COVID-19, um, people have been more uh, stricter with compliances, right? So they really look at who created your products, were they COVID positive, you know? So sometimes, um, right now, we don't have those regulations in place, but when things start to normalize, they will check who, even who made your product. So 
<coughs> that's one. Uh, so compliance is very important. On top of the current compliances that are already available, they will include um, a lot of the uh, COVID-19 measures to make sure everything is okay. So that's, that's, that's one of the things that uh, you really have to look into. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so I think what is most important in this is to really find a partner, a business partner online, especially for global trade. No? So what we do is um, we partner with um, brokers, on the, uh, brokers in different countries that we serve, so US, Australia. We also have a business partner that, um, that helps us facilitate the trade. So we're able to understand what the rules and regulations are. And we're able to pass this down to a lot of the MSMEs that we're able to help. So for example, in the US, um, certain products or ingredients are not allowed. So once we are able to look at this, uh, look at the, the products that are being asked, uh, where, where we're asked to sell them, um, you know, we check and make sure that, okay, if you have this particular ingredient, you have to reformulate. So are there other products that we can sell currently? Um, again, e-commerce is a very, uh, um, well, it's very, it, it boomed in the past few months. And so um, uh, because um, governments and economies are down, they are trying to look at um, things that we could, you know, that, that, that they could use um, so to tax because, of course, uh, where else will you get these things? So, you know, if you're, for example, in real estate, they will be a little more lenient. But because they know that e-commerce is up uh, and booming, they will try and um, get taxes from there. So taxes in general, they're not they're not new to just Southeast Asia. So in the in the states uh, where you sell to Amazon, um, resellers or um, uh, uh, you know Amazon stores actually have to pay state and federal taxes already right they have been very strict about this um primarily because um they need to get uh well it's not just about getting government funding but also um but also making sure that uh businesses are legal because a lot of businesses they say that, that you know they they try, they put a photo online but sometimes they don't get a they don't get the actual product so that's that's sort of one way to be able to make sure that businesses are legitimate, um, but in general, uh, you know, uh, you know, these measures are placed uh, well, and we uh, even us uh, as a startup, we have to be able to make sure we comply with these measures, um, really because uh, to to make sure that there are people, you know, in this day and age where there's a pandemic and a recession and a lot of people are suffering, um, it's important to be make sure that. Uh, there, it's important to make sure that we are able to uh, uh, create uh, a, an ecosystem that uh, has accountability, right? So um, uh, I will not take a lot of time, but um, basically if you need, um, well, I'm going to sort of plug also, but if you need um, uh, uh, compliance concerns for global trade, uh, please uh, register on our platform. Uh, we, uh, it's oneexport.net, www.oneexport.net. Um, and uh, we can, uh, you know, curate, uh, you know, uh, if you have certain questions about um, products or making them export ready, we're able to help you with that, right? We currently serve several markets like US, okay. Australia, mm. um, Singapore, um, Taiwan, for example. And we'll be able to help you in terms of very country-specific regulations to your products. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mel. I'll have to stop you there <laughs> in the interest of time. Um, Tuang, for w just want to check if you would have any thoughts that you want to share uh, from your perspective uh, before we close up this uh, session. Yeah. Um, so on taxation, I think um, you know I I grew up in the states um, where in the nineties, so I'm dating myself a little bit, uh, <laughs> but. You know, the e-commerce uh, sector really boomed because um, there was very little legislation or taxation by the government side, especially uh, concerning cross-state, uh, cross-border transactions. Um, so, you know, Amazon really took off because I, as a college student in New York, could buy textbooks from the Seattle heck, uh, warehouses by Amazon and pay no taxes on the books. So uh, it helped them a lot. Uh, in the beginning. Uh, so in, in RCN, especially for startups, um, you know, that are just starting out, maybe I think um, value added taxes, uh, sales taxes 
um, you know, maybe try to enforce them, uh, you know, fairly uh, across all uh, all types of transactions and all types of businesses. But maybe go easy on you know profit taxes, income taxes, and other forms of um, fees and tariffs that businesses have to go through to in order to get an e-commerce or a business license. So I would suggest making it much more easy to innovate and try things out um, so that we can come out of this, you know, on, on, a, on a, uh, a quick bounce. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers for sharing. Thank you for the questions that have come in. Uh, I do apologize that we are not able to answer all of them. Uh, but definitely, you know, keep a lookout because uh, we are having this series as an ongoing. And as we move along, um, actually, some of these questions would likely be answered as well. Of course, um, there are several links that were shared with you earlier from ERIA uh, in terms of the different research and the report that they've done. And I do believe that some of them uh, will cover things like cross-border trade, trade reforms, uh, digital taxation. Uh, and, and, and the works, you know, because the digital economy is here. It has been accelerated because of the pandemic, and we will definitely be seeing more things taking place in the days ahead. So I want to thank you, uh, and thank you for all your responses. Thank you so much. I'll hand the time back to Julia. Thank you very much, TJ. I don't have much to add. Uh, as TJ said, please uh, keep, uh, stay tuned because some of the topics that emerge during these webinars, it's the topics we, we will be discussing in, in the next episodes, especially the one about uh, cross-border trade, trade facilitation. So you will receive some uh, news from us soon. And uh, final piece of information, after this webinar, we will be sharing a very short survey. It will take two minutes where we are asking you a feedback. And that is very important for us to continue, adapt, and define the series as we progress. But the final special thanks, uh, in addition to all of you for being with us today, to our four speakers. They share with us great insights and uh, very interesting remarks. So thank you all once again, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.